Hello, and welcome to this ACT discussion on Treasury Management in Asia. Today, we'll be discussing the complexities and trends that we see in this fast growing and increasingly important market. My name is Wesley Moore. I'm the sector lead for International Treasury Centers for HSBC UK, and I have the pleasure of hosting this session today. By way of background, I have over 20 years of experience in corporate banking across multiple disciplines and countries, and have recently spent a number of years in Singapore, helping UK businesses expand across Southeast Asia. I'm also honored to be joined by a fantastic um, range of panelists covering advisory, banking, and industry, who will share their knowledge and experience with you as we talk through this subject. I'll ask the panelists to introduce themselves in more detail momentarily, but in summary, we have with us today, Tatiana Schaefer, Head of Finance and Treasury Management at KPMG China, based in Hong Kong. Simon Shingleton, Head of uh, Cash Management Sales in our Hong Kong office. And Poi Chan, Asia Treasury Manager for the Italian luxury goods brand, Salvatore Far Faragamo. If I can ask our panelists to introduce themselves in more detail, providing background overview of your role in your organization, so let's start with Poi Cham, and then we can move to Tatiana and then Simon. Over to you, Poi. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Wesley. So, uh, Sarito Fregamo is found in 1927. So, we are one of the major payers in luxury goods in industries. So, we basically have creations, manufacturers, and sales of footwear, leather goods, clothing. Um, silk products for men and women and all made in Italy. Probably the brand is more familiar white by the ladies because they love our shoes and products. So that's why I give men, uh, emphasis is for men as well. So I, I just want to mention it. So it's diversified and then welcome for everyone who have uh, looking for luxury and then uh, comfortable quality goods. So that's why we have present our goods in Italy, uh, worldwide, Europe, America, and Asia markets. In Asia, which is the regions I am right now, this, we cover China, Hong Kong, Taiwan, Macau, Singapore, Malaysia, Australia, Thailand, Japan, Korea, and India. So basically, also a developed countries so we have a presidency or we have wholesale business there so even we don't have direct stores and then we still have our, our presidency there so hong kong is the regional uh, office not only for treasury but for the whole region as well so we have different de departments we work in the same office in hong kong so in hong kong the treasury functions will cover liquidities ethics banking relationship and then we have so and uh, global regional projects. So uh, we work as a team with other departments in the same office. That's great, thank you. And, and Tatiana? Yeah, so I'm also based in Hong Kong as um, Pui. Um, my name is Tatiana Schäfer. I'm heading the finance and treasury management practice for KPMG China out of the Hong Kong office. And before I joined KPMG, I was also a corporate treasurer working for Hereus and um, Mitsui Chemicals in Germany, US and Japan. Within KPMG China, we are advising treasurers um, from A to Z. So amongst others, our team is focusing on setup and reorganization of treasury functions, including implementation of treasury management systems and centralization of treasury processes. But also one question, which obviously a lot of the time is being asked is where should I put up my regional treasury center? And there potentially is it Hong Kong or Singapore when we are looking into shared service centers, potentially uh, Malaysia, Philippines. So I guess all of these um, questions which we are then dealing together with our um, tax colleagues or specialists in the various um, countries. Thank you. And I'm, I'm, I know one of my questions later will bring us on to those points. Um, and finally, Simon, if you, if you could introduce yourself as well. Happily. Thank you, Wesley. So my name is Simon Shingleton. I work for HSBC, also based here in Hong Kong, where I lead a, a cash management sales team uh, for Asia Pacific, effectively supporting your international subsidiaries in the Asian Pacific markets. I've been in HSBC just over 14 years, a couple of years in Hong Kong, previously in Malaysia, and firstly in uh, Mexico. And I find that what, um, what excites me most is people fulfilling 
their purpose in life. And, and, and what I find fascinating about the time at the moment is how technology is actually freeing people up from the daily uh, administrative tasks to be more creative, to be more strategic. And I look forward to having a com uh, to just talking through and hearing to Pui and Tatiana on that topic. Um, and, and as we support treasury managers, finance professionals to become linchpins in their organizations. Uh, clearly, HSBC will not be unfamiliar to many of you. We have a full presence here in Asia Pacific, a, a uh, excitement and intensity regarding our investment here and, and our interest in the region to grow our business in the region. We'll be investing something like six billion US dollars over the next five years. You may have seen that earlier this month, we've announced uh, two uh, co-chief executive offices in the region predominantly because we're looking to grow and expand our presence across the whole of Asia Pacific. So really looking forward to discussion today, Wesley, and very good to see you all. Great, thank you. So having worked in Asia for a number of years, I know that it's a dynamic, fast moving part of the world with rapid development, both in economic growth, but also in technological capability. So my initial questions are gonna revolve around technological trends in the region. And I'd like to come to Tatiana first. We've seen technology play an increasingly important role in treasury management, whether that's in the payments arena, um, connectivity with APIs, um, fintechs helping to drive innovation and um, competition in the, in the market. I wonder if you could share with us what trends you're seeing in the region and, and where technology is really delivering benefit to, to treasurers. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to do so. So I guess what we have learned, and obviously this has been heavily discussed over the last month you know, or year or so, is that the level of uncertainty and also risk awareness has definitely increased. And the management of cash and liquidity in the short, but also medium and long term is in the focus. So cash is king. Um, and I always say when cash is king, treasury is queen. So um, transparency, centralization, and as you mentioned before, digitalization are being pushed where possible and reasonable. And the treasurer is becoming the enabler for the business and is having now the intention of the management again. So what we do see is definitely that the frequency of system vendors such as treasury management systems, also banks as for example, HSBC are partnering with, for example, FinTechs or even acquire um, acquire them and this has increased and being heavily discussed over the last month so treasurers are moving away from as we have seen before having only one system and rather now building up the best of breed using specialized systems um, pulling into banking data treasury management system data and then using um, for example the data lake so what i would like to highlight is a few technologies which we are seeing right now with our clients and which we are also um, discussing and where we do see that those are beneficial because um, either they are freeing up some time they're creating or increasing the transparency um, and or decreasing um, the risk as well so for example treasury um, robotics um, mention one use case is that you can use um, them for the updated of automatic um, balance sheet positions. APIs, I guess, is one word which is heavily discussed um, right now, for example, when it comes to the seamless integration of new application to the treasury management systems or the, the banking landscape and in general, real-time cash management. Um, is, for example, the integration of digital payments, building up of um, payment hubs, what and where do you want to be placed? For example, when you are the corporate, do you want to have the data? Do you want to deal with all the regulation, which potentially um, is then being triggered or where you need to um, be aware of? Um, but I guess in particular, when I would um, need to mention two examples, I would like to say that cash forecasting and e-commerce this is um, something where technology can definitely make sense and where we also see that clients are now also driven because of COVID implementing those. So for example, the liquidity planning with analytics um, where it helps you to um, analyze the cash velocity or predictive simulations, which obviously is then helping you with your um, reporting and also again freeing um, time up there when it comes to the maintenance of the various scenario analysis based on predictive forecasting or data analytics um, with machine learning, which is 
basically not already using API, but let's say one step um, before, which is just helping you with the data clustering, is doing your homework, um, and then having the respective recognition. So I guess those is definitely beneficial to leverage the technology for reporting, also for, for the cash forecast improvement. And because I guess we have learned that um, in this time, you need to react um, maybe faster, you need to be more flexible. And obviously there, you can make use of technology. Obviously, you need to have the respective data points because otherwise you cannot train the respective models. And this is definitely something where some of our um, clients maybe need to do a little bit more homework because one thing is having the data and then the other thing is understanding and also being able to, to use it properly. And there, maybe it's not that we have one size fits all when it comes to the companies, but basically depending on your size, your business module, complexity, data availability, and so on, this is then when you can find um, the, the respective module and maybe one sentence to e-commerce, um, which is also heavily discussed, for example, not only um, here in China, but also in India, which um, we can do see a lot of change. Um, and basically there are a lot of fast pace and this has become an important sales channel over um, the last year, or also years. And I guess this will be a factor in the future, not only in B2C, but also in, in B2B and to successfully establish um, the e-commerce channels, I guess the treasurer need to do also some homework over here um, to see what kind of aspects do I need to consider for being able, for example, the huge flood of various online-based payments, different payment channels and, and methods, how I can integrate them into my existing treasury um, system landscape or how do I need to update my systems or the, the architecture um, behind the scenes for being able to being um, keeping up with, with the business. Yeah. I mean, it's very interesting around the sort of changing in the payments landscape from a collections perspective. And, I, and I'm sure Poi will have some thoughts around that for, for receivables from, from their clients. But I guess, Simon, sort of linking into the point around technology and the payments landscape, I wonder what you're seeing in the development in this area, specifically, I guess, for treasurers managing payments out um, and, and how that's changing sort of how they're managing cash movements, how they're reconciling payments out and, and ultimately, I guess, managing working capital. Are you seeing developments in that space? I'd love to listen to Tatiana speaking. I, 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 Real-time payments clearly well known. Um, the use of wallets well known here across Asia Pacific. It's exciting. Uh, the use of payments to proxies, payments to mobile telephone numbers, passport numbers, and, and it's exciting to see how that's slowly building out from domestic to now cross-border. Uh, uh, we've seen transactions earlier this year between Singapore and Thailand through real-time payments. And then and then also in terms of open APIs and the shift to open banking, and, and that's increasing. And we see HKMA working with Thailand, with UAE in terms of using CBDCs and applications for that for real, uh, for cross-border payments. And then we have People's Bank of China that looking at uh, e-Remimbi and how that may be used in the, PR, uh, in the PRD and the GR, uh, GBA between Shenzhen and Hong Kong. And I think it's, it's, exciting. it's exciting to see how payments are now being used to connect people or improve the connections between people. And I, I think it's actually extremely exciting to see how those real-time payments and those APIs are being, uh, how we're connecting with our customers and our engagement uh, and s s discussions around those. So just this morning, actually, I was speaking to one client who's now looking at how to set up a, is looking at setting it up an app. So they've been traditionally using a, a uh, bricks and mortar presence. They're now looking to set up an online portal an application to be able to collect online through um, e-wallets, through uh, credit cards, debit cards, bank transfers, and how they're expecting to see a, a five-fold increase in their business as a result of doing that. But what's really interesting is one, making sure they have the capacity to deal with that five-fold increase in business. And then, but then secondly, it's actually what kind of opportunities that give them to engage their customers differently. So traditional bricks and mortar present, you're, you're speaking to customers face-to-face, -face, you're building your brand, you're demonstrating your band face-to-face. -face. Uh, via an application, how do, you, how do you demonstrate your band? 
And then secondly, what does it mean in terms of customer service, the use of APIs for customer service? So there are new questions around how payments not only connect people across borders, but actually how payments can be used to grow businesses and how payments can be used to, uh, and this is coming back to the working capital, this is coming to the working capital bit, how payments can be used to develop relationships between buyers and suppliers, between businesses and their customers. And I find that absolutely, uh, I, find it, I find it fascinating. So what does it mean? And how do you engage with banks about it? So we have API developer portals being set up. And what does it mean if you're able to engage not only your customers differently, but how you're able to build your experience for your employees differently? So if I, if for example, we work with a number of uh, businesses in, for example, food delivery, parcel delivery, ride hailing, those types of companies, and, and typically they would be paying their riders their, uh, or, or their drivers on a, a weekly or fortnightly basis. But what does it mean to be able to connect via API, not only in the impact on working capital, but actually in terms of being, building employee satisfaction? Because the rider is not waiting one week, two weeks for their payment. They're able to do a call and receive their payment immediately. So they know that they're able to support their family on the next working day. So it's, again, using APIs, using payments to build, change the experience with customers, to demonstrate your band of customers, and to build your experience with your employees. So real-time payments, number one, in terms of the inbound, how that impacts working capital, and on the outbound, also how that impacts working capital. But beyond that, what we're seeing, and it, it very much depends on the market, there's certainly a shift now in the use, for example, of commercial cards, virtual cards. So while they were traditionally used on um, for travel and entertainment, clearly none of us have really been traveling or entertaining over the last 12 months, and let's hope that changes. Uh, or maybe it simply won't because behavior has shifted. We're all far more used to uh, engaging with each other virtually rather than face-to-face. -face. But certainly we're seeing a shift in, and it's led by markets like Australia in the use of uh, procurement cards, virtual cards uh, for the payments to the suppliers, but not only to suppliers, but we're seeing it for petty cash spend, uh, utility payments. So I would say there's been a sh there is an increasing shift depending on the market from bank transfers to virtual cards, from ACH to real-time payments, um, triggered via API, certainly where customers are trying to build the relationship with their customer and grow their business through that experience. So if you, we, see, we see these APIs, uh, these real-time payments being used, for example, loan disbursements, refund processes triggered via, via, via app. And then on the virtual cards where we're certainly seeing in the e-commerce, in these platform players, so digital, digital spend or the platforms issuing a virtual card to their merchants to facilitate with their digital spend. So these are the types of discussions we're having uh, which were which are supporting the work, working capital thanks Simon. i think you touched on a really interesting point there around whether we will revert back to normal and i want to come to for you on this and and you know staying with the technology theme i guess technology has been incredibly important over the last year and a half um, yeah, enabling flexible working environments enabling um, companies to, to contact customers remotely I wonder how has Ferragamo adopted technology to manage this sort of working procedure and enhanced efficiency? And I guess as a secondary question, what elements of this do you think will remain afterwards once the world goes back to normal? And has there been actually some seismic shift in how the business operates? Yeah, thanks, Wesley. So honestly, an enhancement in technologies for the companies is ongoing project. But I think in the in this year, especially, that will make it faster. So you have to implement more technology to your work uh, environment to keep the uh, operation smooth. So I will give uh, maybe like three examples in my company, how we implement in, in this year. So make our working environments to adopt the change of the, the, uh, the whole dynamic of the business world. So first is we understood like home Working from home is like really challenging for treasury operations in Asia, especially because we have a lot of documents to sign, not because of internally uh, procedure, but also the regulatory requirement from the bank or the local authorities. So working from home could be, a, could be really challenging sometimes. 
So especially regional office, we need to handle all signatures that over the world, not only in the local office, but the regional office in Hong Kong and our headquarters in Italy. So you're talking about two continents in the world. So, and plus the lockdown issues in this year. So we probably take extra time for the document circulation. So, uh, so that's why we need it. And we need the technologies uh, uh, go quicker than we thought. So that's why we think about one thing is if we want to cater to certain uh, the workflow for the document signatories. So my company start using uh, e-signatories for internal document in some locations. So for, for it, we can make the whole process uh, turn around time shorter. And also we can add the timestamp, which is uh, including the control code we could be fulfill the banking requirements and also the audit trail for that a new procedures. So for example, we got the e-signatures and then we got the uh, whole document cited. We have the initiator to include all related party. So once the document being cited, it will send the uh, fully cited document to the uh, related party by emails. So is it like seamless? So once it's signed, everyone related could get the same copy so we can make uh, to follow up what they want to do. So we find like saving the time for the delivery and also make the turnaround time quicker, no matter the, the time zone differences. Yeah, so this is really, uh, we're trying to have a more location to apply this new process, as long as the regulations and banking, especially for bank. So <laughs> you accept this, uh, uh, I will hope so. I will just uh, talk about with my regional uh, relationship manager uh, with the bank, which is HSBC. So just want to say that that would be really efficient. And secondly is the infrastructure again. So we have digitalized the documents in the shared drive. So whenever we have a laptop, we connect the VPN of the company. So uh, we can share the documents uh, no matter the lo uh, location, even we work from home or we have an other uh, location to work with, uh, to work. So that would be help a lot uh, on the on the communications. So that's uh, another thing. I think another concern is the communications. So when we having a really serious work from home arrangement, we could maybe work from home for a whole week. Uh, so how we keep the communication smooth, no matter internally and externally. So we start using Teams is another uh, other tools that we can share file, video, so uh, make the record. So we find it really smooth and then uh, we have it in Italy and also the whole uh, enterprise. So I think so far we have implemented all of this in Asia with this year. So um, I would say it's really, helpful for us to working remotely and adopt the technology changes in that dynamic but, uh, working environment. And, and, and yeah, again, interesting point on the, the e-sign. Yeah, we, we hope the regulators can, <laughs> can help <laughs> the banks accept those things. Um, and, and, and I guess that brings me on to, to the thoughts that, you know, when, when I worked in Asia, it's clearly a very complex region from a, a, a regulatory perspective, and there's a vast range of controls and, and currency controls across different countries. Um, I guess many of the decisions made by treasurers as they enter the Asia market or optimize their operations in Asia are driven by this regulatory control and currency control across the region. I guess, Tatiana, you, you mentioned it earlier in, in your sort of um, introduction, but I'm interested in, to see what you're seeing across the region in respect of where clients are choosing to put their RTCs, but also shared service centers, payment factories, et cetera. And what's the driver behind those decisions? But maybe also for our viewers, um, what you feel might be happening in the future that maybe might move those decisions left and right. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, yeah. I guess definitely before before I maybe jump into where do we see RTCs being set up or also SSCs, um, definitely regulation is a driver, especially here in Asia, right? I guess even more than in EMEA or Americas, no matter what you want to implement, if it's 
I guess what nearly everybody has like cash pooling or virtual accounts or in-house bank. Basically for all of these solutions, you really need to look into the various market and to see, okay, can I do it or can I do it only with, with, with potential restrictions? And then this is potentially then even, even depending on what kind of industry are you in which um, various markets or countries do you have business? So I guess, unfortunately here, it's not that straightforward. And um, also regulations um, keep keep changing. So for this reason, I guess treasurers, um, yeah, they not only need to deal with the um, daily work, but also seeing, okay, is potentially the setup or the restrictions changing so that I can adapt my um, system landscape or the entire um, setup of, of the treasury itself, right? But maybe, but maybe back to your questions about what do we see, um, for example, when it comes to regional treasury centers, um, I guess overall and, and potentially everybody knows like a regional treasury center is obviously having a lot of benefits and, and advantages, especially also tax driven um, and hopefully increases the, the process efficiency just because of the fact that you are closer to the regulation that you are in the same time zone as your business, which you are um, going to support. Um, so for this reason, you should think what is the appropriate um, location, what is the appropriate allo allocation and enforcement of the rules and responsibilities you want to have within the treasury center, or potentially do you want to broaden it that it's not only a treasury center, but potentially like an operational hub. So then it not doesn't only need to look at treasury, but also procurement, controlling, accounting, sales. So basically not only one department, but potentially have this from, from top down, which is quite crucial that you look at this from a group governance perspective. And I guess in Asia, there's always the, the challenge and maybe I gave a quick sneak peek at the beginning. Where do you want to build up the CTC or FTC, how our friends in Singapore are calling it? Um, it's basically between Hong Kong and, and Singapore. And um, one of the most important drivers, again, I guess, is, is tax or where do you have business and what kind of markets? And um, I guess here you should differentiate between financial and operational considerations and then evaluate for yourself what are the most important ones. Um, so for example, when we would look into financial, um, financial factors as like open market, what is the attractive taxation in your particular case? Obviously this is depending on the client, tariff reports, then in case you are um, closely connected to China, for example, Renminbi access, what are the various tax incentives which the respective government is giving you for building up your regional treasury center there. So what we there always recommend is staying close to the regulator, making sure that you understand the rules or the regulatory behind the scenes in the appropriate way, and also see where is the strategy or where does the respective country want to put the focus on in the future. And then also from a port perspective, when we are looking into financial hub in, in Asia, and then on the operational side, points are the geograph uh, geography proximity, human capital, because at the end of the day, you need labor, you need the treasury experts, potentially also what are your peers doing, and um, potentially you can learn from, um, from what have they experienced in the past, transportation network, international access, cost of living, telecommunications, so I guess this is more from like a broader perspective. Um, and then maybe from a shared service center where they're potentially it's more cost um, sensitive. So I guess we don't um, see any SSCs in, in Hong Kong or Singapore, but then more um, likely potentially in the mainland, India, Malaysia or, or Philippines as, as well. I guess in the outsourcing page in the outsourcing space, China is increasing, but definitely there, I guess India is, is on, on the leading on the leading space. That's great, thank you. And and I guess just staying with that sort of thought process, Simon, you know, cash pooling, I think Tatiana sort of hinted there towards it, is, is a key sort of motivator for treasurers when they're setting up regional treasury centres. However, you know, as we know in Asia, it's it's not always simple to move money in and out of, of countries. I wonder what you're seeing in the liquidity management space and, and if there's any sort of 
changes or innovation from from sort of banks etc that to help treasurers in that in that space so I would say in terms of regulation, I haven't seen a great deal of change. You know, open markets remain open, closed markets typically remain closed. We've seen some change, and maybe Tatiana, feel free to jump in, but certainly we've seen some opening, some more opening up with uh, setting up of new schemes by um, uh, People's Bank of China, uh, specifically piloting uh, within the GBA, within the, the Beijing free trade zone, looking at new quota levels, criteria for multinationals to be able to, to convert FX uh, from the local currency to, to foreign currency in order for onward payment. So there's been some opening up on the Chinese space, uh, but broadly the other countries remain very much, um, very, very similar. So what has changed is quite clearly the, the environment in which in which we're looking at liquidity. So if I think about liquidity, if I were to simplify it, and you know, treasurers broadly have three goals. Number one is they're looking to centralize their cash in order to be able to pay down debt. Secondly, they may be looking to offset some credit and debit balances, depending on the performance of the entities. And thirdly, you know, they, they look to centralize their cash for yield enhancement. And, and with, the, with the wider environment um, over the last 12 to 15 months, yield enhance, enhancement is less, of, uh, uh, less applicable as it once was, which again, leads to different types of conversations. But when, we, when, I'm, when I'm thinking about the customers that we're dealing with, as, as Tatiana was talking about, certainly on the liquidity management side, we're still seeing the focus on how do I centralize my cash? How do I do that domestically? How do I do that cross-border? So we're seeing the setting up of pools, um, most commonly in Hong Kong and Singapore, but also actually clients, uh, European-based clients, often just moving the cash directly into a global pool based out of Europe. Um, and once they've centralized it, what do I do with that money? In fact, I, I can think of a privately owned company that very recently the, the, the owners extracted cash from the business because they realized they're not getting the enhancement on their balances that they once were. So the challenge to the company was, how do I use technology? How do I set up apps? How do I create a new user experience? So I come back to the same thing, like a broken record. Simply, this is what our customers are looking at. So how, how do I invest my cash? Because it's not the deposits aren't earning me anything. How do I invest it to grow my business? So there's a different type of conversation. But coming back to your question on the bank side, it's very much around how do we provide uh, visibility to a client's cash once it's centralized through that? Be that through e-banking, through the provision of dashboards, cash flow forecasting tools. We have clients that are also looking at using a third party dashboard, a fintech provider. So again, how do the banks engage with that fintech provider via APIs to provide that real time reporting? So it's um, uh, extremely, it's extremely interesting. The only other thing I would mention just off the back of Tatiana's response is that one thing is setting up a regional treasury center. And we do have clients that are pursuing that. And I would agree certainly in Hong Kong and Singapore. But the other thing is where one is where my where is my regional office? So we see a kind of a further distribution of real regional offices moving maybe from Hong Kong to Sing or Singapore to a lower cost location like Malaysia, where you still have all the language skills geographically, it's well positioned politically, it's stable. So they may have the regional office in one location, but the pool in another location. And um, I completely lost my train of thought, Wesley. <laughs> but I, I would say it's, it's very much through the provision of dashboards. Is through the provision of cash flow forecasting tools. It's the support in the domestic cash concentration, the, cr the cross-border cash concentration structures to get the money into a regional pool. We see more multinationals now when they're looking at setting up uh, those pools and uh, not only shared service centers, but they're then they're also looking at payments on behalf of, receivable on behalf of. That's certainly a theme that's coming through more, especially amongst the Europe, European multinationals. So we're discussing that more. And then also how do banks partner with fintech, fintech to provide visibility or reporting over the liquidity once it's been held? But again, I would come back to the same point. Unless you're looking to pay down debt, unless you're looking to offset those credit and debit, uh, debit balances, if what you were once looking for was yield enhancement, you're not getting that now. So it changes the discussion with banks to um, technology. How do I use the liquidity to further the growth of my business? And then also it changes the discussion with banks from one, let's not negotiate on rates, but let's just negotiate on transactions, which it's, it's a different type of conversation. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I guess staying with liquidity, and, and Tatiana mentioned this earlier, cash is king, but... You know, never more so than in luxury retail. <laughs> um, I wonder, sort of, 
you know, given the impact that we've seen, certainly in the retail space over the last year plus, I wonder how Ferragamo sort of managed, you know, that process that, yeah, and, and how that's impacted on your cash uh, and cash flow sort of thought processes. I wonder if you can yeah. talk to us around how you've managed that and, and, and whether there's anything specific you wanted to call out. Yeah, so, but when uh, Tatiana has been uh, said, uh, cash is king, and I just think about the counterparts and all the treasury position in Asia, most of them are ladies. So treasury is <laughs> queen, probably quite true, actually. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, lastly, back to your question. So, uh, it's tough. So, I think everyone agrees that the pandemic, the whole world changes these days, affect cash flow of every different industry, no matter like KBNG or banking industry, they all, they all have different reactions on that changes. So, but for our luxury retail, we do see the changes because we have less tourists, and the shopping behavior change, no matter in the uh, high-end fractions or its daily uh, commodities, it completely changed in the last six months to an, an year. So to make it sufficient impact on the liquidity in it. So as a regional treasurer, so we need to adapt the changes and react quickly because we need to communicate with different counterparts and also to the headquarters as well. So when the local... Uh, uh, have a situation, say, lockdown for coming 30 days. So you have that need to bring it out to the headquarter and then see what's the strategy to have a sustainable liquidity strategy in a short period of time. So these days you can't think really long-term, like five-year plan that you, you really familiarize before. Right now it's like one-year plan, probably quite long. So, uh, so we aim for like some sustainable uh, and more flexible strategies. So... We will and we evaluate the credit resources from time to time. So it means from, from time to time means weekly even that we review the, uh, the liquidity sources and then credit resources of different locations. So and then we work with the banks and other intercompany closely. So see what, how we change the strategy. Not a big changes. Talking about revaluation is not putting something brand new. How we adjust the amount or the way we do so make it the, the, the reaction time even shorter. So the company have enough level of short-term capital. So make the operation small. So we are retail, so we have store, we have our wholesaler. They, they all like uh, operation driven. So make the money and close the deal is really important to them to make it small. So we aim for like enough level of short-term capacity is our, our main target. So, uh, so this is the one thing that we review, uh, review internally. And also for the external party, we have also wholesale business or like a travel retail uh, in, in terminals, in airports. So we have more flexible on the terms. So we can have both uh, override and we have overcome all the situation, uh, could have a win-win situation for them and for us to survive. So it's not only like maintain the relationship, it also is maintaining the good uh, company image and also the brand image. So this, uh, we think we learn it and then we try to work closely with our counterpart and our business partners in this day. We learn it and then we keep going and we believe we're just having a tough time, but it's going better and better in the rest of the year. Fantastic to hear. Um, I guess just, just, a final question, and, and this is a single question to each of you, and I'll, and I'll come to you in turn. For our viewers of this session who are considering setting up a regional treasury center in Asia or uh, entering the market for the first time, I wonder what one piece of advice you would give to them. And I'll, I'll allow you to pick whether it's a complex regional treasury center or whether it's a treasurer whose, whose business is, is just opening in Asia. But if I can come to you first, Poi, if you can maybe give a one pearl of wisdom that, that our viewers can take away. Uh, one word is people. I still think it's people. The tax, the banking factors, the currency environment, government incentive, incentive actually it is not, it's out of control of the, the, the business. So what you can control is getting uh, ability of skills and talent. 
to make it happen. Thank you. And Tatiana? My recommendation would be don't do it alone um, because it's not only affecting Treasury what you are doing, but also other departments, as we were saying before, tax, legal, accounting, controlling, and so on. So I guess really go together um, with other departments, with other potentially learn also from peers that you don't need to make the, the same mistakes and advise or basically go for advice and engage the, the regulator or the external parties at an early stage to make sure that you are going into the right direction. Thank you. And, and Simon, final word from you. I'd give two pieces of advice. I thought so you might. <laughs> yeah, got to, got to complicate it. So I would say number one is have the initial discussion, but follow, follow up conversations, bring your CTO with you. So technology is such an important part of the conversation now that it, it doesn't need to only be, the conversation shouldn't only be driven by treasury or finance, but bring your CTO into the discussion. We're seeing it across the board. Why don't I just leave it that one piece of advice? I guess the second, the second piece of advice is I would actually say, there's no need for you to send off 100 page Q&A documents to, your, to the banks that you're thinking of partnering with in the region. You can simply say, you know me, here are, my, here are my goals for what I'm trying to achieve in Asia Pacific. Please tell me how you think I should approach the region, how you think I should set up the business using what you already know about my company or companies like me. So I would actually just simply go to your banks and ask a couple of key questions, tell them what your priorities are and wait to see what you get back. It's a much simpler process for you, a cheaper process for you, and it's challenging banks to bring insights to you, which they should be able to do. Great, thank you, Simon. And, and interesting, those responses are generally all about people rather than uh, technology. So maybe there's, there's hope for us all yet. Um, so look, thank you to all of our speakers uh, today. I'm sure that you will have found the session very informative and hopefully it provides benefit to you as you develop treasury uh, capabilities across Asia. Thank you all for watching this session and I wish you all a great day ahead. Thank you. <laughs>